So our mission is to bring to market disruptive cellular medicines to treat serious and life-threatening diseases. We differentiate ourselves from others by really focusing on three main areas. The first is our underlying platform technology. The second is the execution capability for commercialization. And the third is to develop a robust pipeline of clinical product candidates. We believe we're working with probably the most potent type of adult stem cell of mesenchymal lineage. This is protected by an extensive IP portfolio, and we have a sound understanding of mechanistically how these cells work, and this allows us to identify the appropriate disease targets. From a commercialization perspective, we have a team that is, has a sound understanding of the regulatory and reimbursement landscape. We work with Lonza as our contract manufacturer, so they're able to meet our supply forecast for commercialization. And we have experience with our partner, JCR Pharmaceuticals in Japan, who are marketing and selling uh, their product for acute graft-versus-host disease in both pediatric and adult patients. And finally, we have three programs in phase three and a number of programs with phase two data readouts, which allow for both near and midterm uh, value inflection points. Now, I think everyone in this audience understands the 21st Century Cures Act, but there's obviously regenerative medicine clauses that allow for the potential of accelerated approval pathways if you're targeting serious or life-threatening diseases with unmet medical needs. We believe all of our lead programs qualify for this, and we're in the process of seeking designation and negotiating with the FDA for taking advantage of these pathways. I alluded about our IP portfolio. We have over 800 patents. Uh, this covers both indication-specific enablement, methods of manufacturing, and most importantly, composition of matter. And these are ring-fenced. We really believe we dominate the IP landscape for mesenchymal lineage cells. The underlying cell platform utilizes positive immunoselection using stro uh, immunoselection, and these are allogeneic cells. And the way the cells work, unlike small molecules and biologics, is that they have receptors for injury. So the sicker the patient, the more advanced the disease, the greater our cells are able to respond. We work with Lonza as our contract manufacturer, predominantly in Singapore. This figure on the right shows that there's obviously the ability to expand the manufacturing plant, but the existing infrastructure allows for at least the first couple of years of commercialization capabilities. And we continue to work with Lonza for optimization of our products, including serum-free medias and 3D bioreactor technologies. This is a snapshot of our product portfolio. At first glance, it may look somewhat eclectic. Phase three programs in chronic heart failure, phase three programs in chronic lower back pain, phase three programs in graft or host disease, and a myriad of uh, phase two programs in inflammatory diseases such as biologic refractory RA and diabetic nephropathy. However, they're all underpinned by a common mechanism of action and robust preclinical models that are able to identify a safe and effective dose. We've now treated over 1,500 patient exposures, and the therapy is extremely well tolerated. I'll focus the majority of the talk now on our three lead programs. We'll start with heart failure. This is the continuum of heart failure. Patients uh, develop heart failure, then they'll have one, two, multiple heart failure hospitalizations. Ultimately, their prognosis is either death, uh, the receipt of a mechanical assist device, an LVAD, or a heart transplant, of which there's less than 2,000 in the United States. We'll start with the most severe stage of heart failure. This is class four. Uh, there's approximately 300,000 of these patients in the United States, and they have a 50% annual mortality rate. So this is a disease that's as bad as some of the worst cancers. Uh, one of the modalities for treating these patients is to give them a left ventricular assist device, uh, which brings down the mortality rate closer to 20 to 30%, but they still have uh, multiple hospitalizations for GI bleeds and infections. So we hypothesized that if we could improve mortality further in these patients with LVADs, if we could reduce some of these adverse events, that uh, more and more patients would receive the LVADs, they'd live longer, and perhaps if we're able to repair the heart function, you could even remove those LVADs and explant them at a future date. So the NIH uh, sponsored an initial phase two study in 30 patients, randomized controlled, 20 treated, 10 controls. This explored our lowest dose of cells, 25 million cells directly injected into the heart at the time of LVAD implantation. Primary endpoint was 90 days, and what we showed is that 30% uh, of the controls died at 90 days compared to none of the treated patients, and 50% of the treated patients were able to tolerate turning off the mechanical assist device for a period of time compared to only 20% of the controls. Again, this is with the lowest dose. 
On the basis of this, the NIH decided to sponsor a much larger trial that potentially could be used for marketing approval using the higher dose of 150 million cells. This study has now completed recruitment. Uh, the primary endpoint is looking for the ability to temporarily turn off the heart at six months, and we should read out this trial result uh, by the first quarter of next year. Now let's transition to the class two and three heart failure patients. This represents maybe 40% of the heart failure uh, opportunity. However, these patients still have an unmet medical need, still have a high degree of mortality and heart failure hospitalization. We initially did a 60-patient randomized controlled study, phase two study, exploring three different doses versus control, 25 million, 75 million, and 150 million. And what these two figures show is that over six months, in the highest dose of 150 million cells, we demonstrated greater than 25 ml reduction in systolic and diastolic volume. Highly clinically meaningful, and this data corresponded with our preclinical large animal studies that demonstrated to get the maximum benefit, you had to deliver more than 110 million cells. Now, when we looked at the most advanced patients, accounting for about 60% of our patients enrolled in phase two, those patients at baseline that had a systolic volume of greater than 100 ml, so large dilated hearts, we saw that the effects were even more pronounced. So we were very happy with a 25 ml reduction. Now we're seeing greater than 50 ml reduction in systolic and diastolic volume and greater than 8% improvement in injection fraction. But these are really surrogates for the heart endpoints, dying and uh, heart failure hospitalization. That's what the FDA cares about as well as the patients. So when you look at those endpoints, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of a time to first heart failure hospitalization and cardiac death. You'll see that flat line up, up at top demonstrates the high dose of cells. So over three years, no one died, no one went to the hospital compared to a third of the controls. When you look at the right side, you could see those patients with the most advanced stage of heart failure, 71% of the patients had an event in the controls, again, versus none of our treated. So on the basis of that, we went into a phase three trial, and we were looking for enrolling patients that are enriched so they'll have more events quicker. And we define that as having to have had a prior heart failure hospitalization in the past nine months or having had elevated NT pro BNPs. And the primary endpoint is looking for reoccurring heart failure hospitalizations, and it takes into account cardiac mortality. This is a joint frailty model. To give you an update, we're more than two thirds of the way recruited. We recently uh, successfully passed the pre specified interim analysis looking at the primary endpoint, suggesting that there's biological activity. DSMB allowed the trial to continue to recruit, and we anticipate finishing recruitment next year. I'll now transition to acute graft versus host disease. Uh, about 30,000 allogeneic bone marrow transplants are done each year. Half of those patients will develop graft versus host disease, and half of those will be refractory to steroids. When it starts to attack the GI and liver, it's extremely problematic with a very high mortality rate. Uh, where only 20 to 30 percent of the patients, especially children, survive 100 days. So it's a matter of life or death. Initially, we did a 28 patient study in children, randomized controlled, 14 treated, 14 controls. And what we found was about two thirds of the treated children responded, had an overall response that correlated with 100 day survival versus only 20 percent of the controls. On that basis, the investigators refused to randomize children to a control arm, and we set up an expanded access program and enrolled. Uh, 241 children. This is after they've received every off-label therapy possible. They still uh, were failures and they received our therapy. And what we found is that 80, over 80% 80 of the patients survived 100 days if they responded compared to less than 40% of the non-responders. On the basis of that, the FDA allowed us to do an approximate 60 patient large trial, open label because it's unethical to randomize these children to uh, a control arm. And they said if you could demonstrate similar type of findings in patients that have only failed steroids, that they'd give us a, a, a initial marketing approval. We already passed an interim analysis looking at the primary endpoint. This trial uh, should read out by the end of this year the primary endpoint. Switching now to chronic lower back pain. Uh, this is uh, especially relevant now with the opioid epidemic. Uh, there's greater than 30,000 deaths each year due to misuse of opioid prescription medication. And interestingly, half of those patients uh, are, are prescribed opioids for chronic lower back pain. This is uh, especially relevant also for the 21st Century Cures Act, which allocated a significant amount of money towards trying to prevent opioid dependence. Uh, in addition, the FDA recently has given accelerated approvals through fast track designation, breakthrough designation for therapies tackling pain that avoid the need for opioids. So we clearly believe that uh, the RMAT designation for our back pain product uh, should meet the definition. Now, chronic lower back pain, it's a market that's probably as large as heart failure. Uh, these are patients who are typically at the prime of their lives, 45 years old. 
uh, they've been living with degenerative disease disease for a number of years, and they don't want to have that big orthopedic spinal fusion surgery. Many of them have, uh, are bed-bound and severe back pain. We initially did a 100-patient phase 2 study, randomized controlled, and we wanted to set a very high bar. We wanted to demonstrate 50% reduction in pain, 30% improvement in functionality, and no intervention. So no steroid injection, no uh, spinal fusion. And if you met all of that at multiple time points, especially 12 and 24 months, then you met our composite endpoint. And what you see here is that the two doses, 6 million and 18 million in green and blue, are able to demonstrate more than three times as many uh, patients responded of this composite endpoint compared to the controls in black saline. So this is our primary endpoint for phase three that we're now actively enrolling, a 360-patient study. We should finish uh, recruitment uh, later this year, and uh, we look forward to reading out these results uh, in approximately two years after that unless we could get an accelerated approval pathway and look at the, those findings earlier through an RMET designation. So I think I'll stop there, open it to any uh, remaining questions. We obviously have a number of milestones and catalysts coming up. I think I covered most of these. Uh, all of our lead programs are actually unpartnered, however, and we're in negotiations with a number of parties now for uh, our lead applications. So thank you.